Welcome to episode 19 of Arbiter of Worlds. If you're a returning subscriber, thanks for supporting the channel. If you're new to the channel, hello. Here at Arbiter of Worlds, we study the art and science of running and creating tabletop role-playing games. Let's get into it. Today, we're going to address the perennial debate of rule zero versus rules as written. This argument has been going on for decades, but with the rise of blogging and social media, it's become very visceral within our subculture. It's like World War I trench warfare on Twitter sometimes. For instance, the RPG pundit says, rule zero is the key to tabletop RPGs. Without rule zero, there is no RPG hobby. The people who are anti-rule zero were either traumatized by bad DMs or have self-serving motives. Meanwhile, the Luddite.com says, rule zero is the biggest cop-out crock of shit in all of tabletop gaming. So this is not a minor difference of opinion. This is fundamental, and it's arising even within the friendly and agreeable old school RPG community. But what is rule zero? Rule zero states, well, I wish I could give you a clear expression of what rule zero states, but unfortunately, there's actually a number of different definitions with different nuances. For instance, the D&D 5e Dungeon Master Guide says, if a rule isn't functioning as intended or isn't adding much to your game, you can refine it or ditch it. No matter what a rule source, a rule serves you, not the other way around. Vampire the Masquerade says, the most important rule of all and the only real rule worth following is that there are no rules. You're the arbiter of what works best in your game, and you're free to use, alter, abuse, or ignore the rules at your leisure. Paranoia says, GM rule number one is that you are in charge. You are always right. If you don't like a rule, the rule is wrong. If a die roll gives you a result you don't like, the die is wrong. DD4Fandom.com says, Rule zero is the unwritten but commonly understood rule that the game master can override published game rules for any reason. FrontlineGaming.org says, Every tabletop RPG has a rule zero that goes like this. The game master may change, modify, ignore, or add to the rules as he or she sees fit to ensure the game is fun and moves smoothly. Other variations include, the GM has the right to supersede the rules as written, the GM always has the last word, and the GM is always right. So there's many different variations of rule zero, and if you pay attention to the language, they are saying different things. And the most important variation in what they're saying is in whether the use of rule zero is conditional or arbitrary. Vampire the Masquerade says, the only rule is that there are no rules. You're free to use, alter, or abuse, or ignore the rules at your leisure. Well, this is an arbitrary rule zero. It's probably the broadest expression of arbitrary rule zero ever put in print. D&D 4 Fandom also offers an arbitrary rule zero that the GM can override the rules for any reason. The GM is always right is another example of an arbitrary rule zero. On the other hand, the D&D 5e DMG, when it says, if a rule isn't functioning as intended or isn't adding much to the game, then you can change it. That's a conditional rule zero. It's conditional on something being broken or subtractive. The assumption is that you apply the rules as written unless that condition is fulfilled. Paranoia also has a conditional rule zero, but the condition is much broader. If the GM doesn't like a rule, the rule is wrong. So therefore, we need to subcategorize the difference between 5e and paranoia, and we might call it an objective versus subjective distinction or a functional versus aesthetic distinction. So we have actually three broad approaches to rule zero. There's the functional conditional rule zero, there's the aesthetic conditional rule zero, there's the arbitrary rule zero, and these differences are not small. They're huge. In fact, if role-playing games were legal systems, each and every one of these different rule zeros would be the equivalent of an entirely different philosophy of law. As you guys know, I'm by training both an ancient historian and an attorney. And the one thing I've learned from both is that people have been arguing about rules for millennia. Some of the earliest texts ever found have been legal disputes on clay tablets with people arguing over the meaning and application of contracts. It started in Sumeria, it has never stopped. For thousands of years, business people, lawyers, and judges have known, anytime you have rules, you have ambiguity as to what those rules mean. And to solve this ambiguity, the science of jurisprudence was developed. 
Now, in our Anglo-American legal tradition, jurisprudence was considered a formal science with a clear purpose. The purpose of the law was justice. Human law was supposed to embody natural law, which existed objectively and could be discovered, like mathematics. And this goes all the way back to Blackstone. And to accomplish this, judges learned what were called the canons of statutory interpretation and the formal methods of applying them to reach conclusions. And they believed that the process of judging was actually the process of discovering the objectively right rules for the situation given the purpose of law. And the intent was to have predictable, easily understood rulings that could be deduced from the existing law and agreed upon by all. And this method was used more or less successfully for many centuries. Then, in the 20th century, this centuries-old view was overturned by two new schools of jurisprudence called legal positivism and critical legal studies. To vastly oversimplify, these schools argued that law had no purpose except power and no objective existence. The law was just whatever judges said the law was. Under these schools of jurisprudence, the job of lawyers became to persuade judges what the law should be based on policy outcomes, not what the law actually was based on formal deduction. Legal positivism made the law into this fuzzy quantum uncertainty. It made the judge into a legislator, even in places when he had no business legislating. And legal positivism has permeated our entire culture. It's trickled down to affect how RPG game masters and game designers think. And so I would argue that almost the entire debate about rule zero versus rules as written presumes the legal positivist stance that rules are essentially arbitrary, that no objective methods can be used to reach conclusions about rules, and that judges, that is GMs, are just exercising raw power. The only question is exactly how the GM should exercise this raw power. And the only check on GM authority is that if the GM is too egregious, the players might quit their game. Well, I reject this stance. I reject it at a deep and philosophical level. If you've read my book, Arbiter of Worlds, or you've been watching my videos, you already know that I believe that RPG rules have a purpose. They have a teleology, which is to simulate an objective campaign world in which players can freely exercise player agency. And because I see rules as purposeful, not arbitrary, I'm an RPG legal formalist, not a positivist. I have a whole chapter devoted to how you can and should apply the canons of statutory interpretation to adjudicate rules disputes. I have a whole chapter explaining why and how you should maintain records of all of your rulings so you can apply them repeatedly and objectively. I have another chapter and a video recommending that you never fudge the dice. So if you accept the player agency theory of fun, and you take the simulationist approach I've been describing for RPGs, then this rule zero versus rules as written debate, it goes away. In an agency-focused simulation, there's never justification for a GM to capriciously override the rules as written on a whim because I'm the GM and I'm always right. That is an absolute violation of the role of GM. At the same time, the lack of rule zero is no justification for a GM to allow himself to be pushed around by players and refuse to do his job, which is interpreting and expanding the rules when necessary to do so. I've said this repeatedly. The primary role of the GM is as a judge. But the sort of judge you should be is a classical judge of the old tradition. You're supposed to apply the rules as written as fairly and objectively as possible. You're supposed to expand the rules as written where necessary, incrementally, and with consistent application. And so from this point of view, there is no rule zero versus rules as written, because rule zero is simply how rules as written gets implemented. So, you know, in the U.S., we have this perennial debate about whether the U.S. government is or should be a democracy or a constitutional republic. You know, in a democracy, the majority's elected representatives decide what the laws are, full stop. If the government decides that owning guns is illegal, then owning guns is illegal. That's how it is in Great Britain, Australia, Canada. In RPG terms, the players are the voters, 
they more or less elect the GM, and then the GM makes the laws, executes the laws, and judges the laws. And there's just no higher authority. You can change the GM, but you can't claim that the GM is wrong. In a constitutional republic, there is a higher law, and no legislator or judge or simple majority can override that higher law. They can interpret it, they can explore it, they can expand it, but they can't just ignore it or disregard it. If they try to do so, there are procedures by which citizens can contest that. So in RPG terms, then, we would say the game rules are the Constitution and the campaign is the Republic. The players are the citizens, and they have a right to expect that the Constitution is upheld by their GM. That doesn't mean the GM doesn't adjudicate the rules when needed. It doesn't mean he doesn't create new rules from time to time when necessary. Of course he does, just like the Supreme Court does when it rules on our Constitution. But he does so in the framework of the existing higher law of the game rules. Now, I have my own variation of Rule Zero that better expresses my own philosophy. It goes like this. Every campaign is a law unto itself. And now note that operative term, campaign. I am not saying every game master is a law unto himself. I am the law. No, the campaign is the law unto itself. The campaign is sovereign. In other words, every campaign has its own constitution that it upholds, which can be written rules on a commercial product. It can be house rules. It can be optional rules. It doesn't have to be the same constitution as other campaigns. But whatever that constitution is, the GM's role is to adjudicate it in a clear and objective manner with the goal of empowering player agency in a simulated world, right? All right, to close this video out, I want to end with a slight rephrasing of the D&D 5th Edition Dungeon Master's Guide, which, if you'll recall, says, a rule serves you, not the other way around. And I say, a rule serves the campaign. That's all for this week. Remember, rule zero of YouTube is that if you enjoyed this video, you need to hit the like and subscribe buttons and shower me with praise on the comments. We'll see you again soon.